Good morning, councillors. Good morning, executive. Um, I notice, uh, and, and good morning to those joining us in the digital gallery this morning. Um, thank you for taking the time out to be with us. It's my privilege to declare the ordinary meeting of the 5th of October open. In doing so, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and also that form the footprint for our uh, great region. I, in doing so, I pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend congratulations to them on their continued nurture of culture. I note a full attendance of councillors and a full attendance of the executive team. Therefore, there are no apologies today and it is uh, now my privilege to um, turn to item four in the agenda for prayers and to welcome um, Wes Bust from the Kelbar Salvation, I always forget whether it's Kelbar or Fassifern Salvation Army, Wes, but it is always great to have you join us and I'll um, hand the microphone over to you. Um, on behalf of uh, all the ministers, we want to commend um, each of you and let you know that uh, we often uh, are bringing you before God in prayer to grant you wisdom and, uh, and clarity around the decisions that you make on our behalf. Um, and so we're going to do that just now as we pause to pray. Loving God, we uh, pause at this time knowing that uh, we are in many, there are many things in, within our world that is uh, uncertain. But Lord, we know that your love for us is uh, something that we can rely on. Lord, today as uh, we open this brand new um, meeting of council, we ask that as we pause, that we would um, we would turn to you for wisdom, for um, mercy, and 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 we would seek your grace in the decisions that need to be made on behalf of our community. Where we pray for um, the entirety of the scenic room from. Um, the east through to the west, to the north to the south. And we ask God that you would continue to provide providence uh, upon our area and we pray. And these things we ask in your name. Amen. Thank you, Wes. It is always a joy to um, have you share with us. Um, and thank you for those uh, words. Thank you for your ongoing service in our community. Uh, it is greatly appreciated. I do understand that uh, you have a busy timetable and that you may not be able to continue to join us through the digital gallery today, but we thank you for your time this morning. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mr. May. Councillors, we move to item five of today's agenda, and that relates to um, declarations of interest. Um, and um, with regard to business before the meeting today. I believe Councillor McGuinness, you wish to speak before I, I do? Uh, yes, Mayor. I uh, have wished to say that I've got a declarable interest in the 10.2 Water for Worrell project and I'll be leaving the meeting uh, when that comes. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillors, I will also make a declaration concerning item 10.2. Uh, uh, in preparing for this ordinary meeting and specifically referring to item 10.2, Water for Worrell, I hereby advise the meeting of a declarable conflict of interest in relation to that matter. This arises because of my prior declaration when the original commencement of this project was reported for noting by council. I'm a director of Binya Proprietary Limited. Binya operates in the horticulture sector but does not have an operating footprint within the region. While I am declaring this conflict of interest, I do so as a matter of maintaining high transparency rather than materiality. The report before Council today identifies wide-ranging benefits should this project be able to progress to fruition. These benefits are indicated across a wide range of agricultural sectors and individual operators, as well as to associated communities. As such, I cannot identify significant materiality in my declared conflict and believe the public interest benefit of myself as mayor being engaged with this matter far exceed any such conflict. I further note that the report before council indicates the future of this project will be operated outside of council control and that there is no requirement or intent for allocation of council resource in this regard. 
Therefore, councillors, I propose to remain in the meeting for the consideration and resolution of item 10.2 as an overall benefit to the public interest. I believe my broader business background, mayoral advocacy and community engagement offer benefit to the consideration and progress of this issue. As required by legislation, I'll ask non-conflicted councillors to consider this request to provide resolution and direction accordingly. In so doing, I also ask that councillors consider clarifying how such requests may apply to future activities from the independent project team. I will remain in the meeting for consideration of this request to assist with information, but obviously will not participate in the vote. I now hand the chair to the Deputy Mayor to um, progress this matter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, councillors, uh, I provide an opportunity for questions uh, to be raised uh, to the Mayor through the Chair uh, regarding uh, this particular project. Uh, acting uh, Chair, I uh, just wonder whether I should be in here for this discussion, given that I had a, uh, there was a, uh, I was uh, investigated when I was involved in this same subject previously, because uh, the both of us have the same conflict on ten, in this. I don't think it's, a, and I seek guidance from staff whether I should leave for this discussion and voting. Uh, thank you, Councillor McGuinness. Um, I will put that to uh, John Picalis from Governance. Yeah, thank you, um, Chair. Yeah, I suppose the, the consideration here is is whether the the interest or the perceived interest that you might might have in the matter is to such an extent that um, you couldn't make a decision in the public interest, and that's a matter for councillors to resolve here today based on the information that they elicit from any questioning or further further information that's that's provided. Uh, Councillor McGuinness, I understand that you would not be entitled to vote on any discussion here, but you may choose uh, if you feel that the benefit of the community is uh, worthwhile and that you may be entitled to uh, stay within the room. Yeah, I, the OIA's opinion was, and I was Deputy Mayor at the time, and I had the casting vote to yeah, agree to that. If they believed I shouldn't have been there to vote on it. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, agreed with the vote. Yep. Sorry, um, Chair, could, could I just say that if, um, if both councillors are conflicted um, or have raised a declarable conflict of interest on the same matter, um, the most prudent course of action would be for, for those councils not to vote on each other's conflict um, because they're both conflicted. Councillor McGuinness, are you happy with that? I've, I've got no problem with that. I'm just wondering whether I should or should not be here for the discussion. I think that relevance to materiality is significant. Are there any other questions uh, to the Mayor through the Chair? Um, my, my question is to you, um, Deputy yes, Chair. Yes, Councillor Swanborough. Uh, my question is based on the, res on the advice that we just received from the Governance Manager. Um, was that advice that in relation to this discussion, but before we get to hear or ask questions of the Mayor, that, that uh, in discussing this matter, both persons should be leaving the room? Would you please clarify that question, please? Uh, yes, the the broader question is not about the individual's conflict of interest at this point in time. It's about whether they should be here for this preliminary discussion. Um, should they be leaving the room prior to coming back and being asked questions about their conflicts of interest? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think if you refer to our standing orders, provides uh, a three-way process for councillors to 
uh, their actions with a declarable conflict of interest. Uh, one is leave the room, two is remain in the room and allow the councillors uh, to then decide on the uh, uh, whether they are entitled to stay in the room and obviously not vote. So the standing orders do allow for a councillor to remain in the room to give provide further information. I think um, nine point. Uh, just have to check that in the sections of um, declarable conflict of interest item nine. So your decision for them to remain in the room? Uh, no, uh, the decision is that of the councillors. Yes. And yes. So it is the decision of the councillors to make the um, outcome of whether the conflicted councillors can remain in the room. So can I just clarify? Doctor, yes, thank can you, I just clarify, are you saying in the terms of the discussion of the decision concerning the conflict of interest? I'm just yes, the, wasn't quite right, yes and the discussion of the, of the decision of the conflict. Yeah. Thank, thank you, um, um, Acting Chair. The, just to clarify, I guess, based on Councillor Swamper's query, nine, and, and you're correct in what you're saying about the declare of conflict of interest, uh, 9.4 clearly states, you know, after councillors declare the conflict of interest, the council should consider leaving the meeting while the matter is discussed unless they have reasons uh, why their participation could improve making. So the, the provisions are included in the standing orders to allow um, and in addressing Councillor Swamper's query before. Um, it's not a matter that's 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 called upon or, or voted by the, 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 the chair, but it's allowable under the, the standing orders and it, uh, it does allow the provision for the elected member that has raised a conflicted to add or to field queries as to whether or not they're included, they're um, intending to stay. Um, as indicated by Councillor McGuinness, he's, he's declared a, a conflict and he's leaving the room. The, the query now pertains to whether he was in, should be in the room to discuss the mayor's conflict of interest at the same time, but that's, um, as, as John indicated, uh, as a governance uh, principle specialist indicated before. Yeah, thank you. That's what I'm trying to resolve. Acting Chair, I, uh, I, I think it's better if I do leave the meeting now, given that I've got a declarable conflict in there and that I shouldn't take part in any discussion. I think it uh, just makes it clearer and cleaner. Thank you, Councillor McGuinness. I noted that Councillor McGuinness is leaving the chamber. Now, are there any other questions of the Mayor regarding uh, his participation in this item? Uh, thank you, um, Mr Deputy Chair. Yeah, my, my question is in relation to uh, the Mayor's declaration that he's the uh, director of a, another agricultural company that doesn't operate uh, within this region. Um, my question is, uh, how are we to foretell or know uh, what the future plans of the company are and whether they not at some future time um, be merging with another grower in this particular region or there are some synergies in relation to uh, the two businesses uh, operating in the same sector and um, uh, could there not be a conflict of interest if um, if the company that uh, you are a director of is also in competition uh, with other growers in this particular region. And how would you resolve that conflict? How would you uh, give assurances that the board of which you're a member are not going to vote at some future time on an acquisition, for instance, in the Worrell Valley? Um, thank I, you, Councillor Swanborough. I'll enter the mayor to respond. Um, I th for the purposes of a de declaration today, I've got to deal with the known facts, not someone's suppositions about what might or might not happen in the future. Um, 
I can only deal with what's known and at the moment what is known from the matter before us today is that it'll be an independently run project. So there's no um, commitment of allocation of resources from council. In terms of my involvement with an entity that um, operates outside the region but may have um, competing Marcus interests, um, I don't believe my Again, I can't tell what the future may or may not be, but I don't believe I have any more conflict than any other person who is an owner or director of a commercial operating agricultural interest that operates outside of the Worrell at present, uh, who might equally in the future see the benefit in operating um, into the Worrell because to secure their future if such a project were to succeed. That would be a commercial decision at a time in the future based on publicly available information. This project's running outside of council, so there would be no proprietary information that um, is foreseeable to council that wouldn't be the subject and control of an independent group. And um, obviously, if there was ever a point in time where a matter came back requiring council to invest or commit additional resource, that would be a time that would be a different matter with requiring a different consideration. Equally, it could be argued the level of materiality is no different to someone who um, makes use of products that are grown in the Worrell and they could see a benefit out of having additional hay supplies available if they were in the equine sector. So the materiality threshold here about what might happen in the future, um, I cannot um, speak to today. I, and I don't believe that's a reasonable consideration. My understanding is that declarations have to be in the context of the matter that's before council at this point in time. And I can, I, I believe I've created a very high level of transparency previously when it was a report for noting, not investment of council. And I've maintained that high level of transparency today by identifying in response to a report that is largely about noting the actions of an independent organisation. And the only reason that I'm, pas I'm passionate about this project is that I know um, such a project will rely on strong advocacy uh, leadership um, at other levels of government. And I believe that's a role that in the public interest I can add value to. There is no other known materiality um, that I can identify with regarding this project. Mr. Swanbrook, uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, the mayor has declared a declarable conflict of interest, and and in these particular circumstances, uh, the question of foreseeability into the future is a relevant consideration in my view. So my question is, how can it be determined that in the future? Uh, given that uh, being able to stay in a meeting and influence the position of other councillors is what is requested, uh, if, albeit that he cannot vote uh, on those circumstances, but in the future, um, how can it be guaranteed by anybody around this room that there will not be other material support for this particular project, given that uh, council has already uh, assisted, and and I, I make no judgment about that decision. But council has already assisted to the value of a hundred thousand dollars for a a, uh, a preliminary assessment with the Jacobs Group. Um, I'll just pause here for a moment because uh, I see a, a general manager shaking her head vigorously. I might ask her for a comment on. That statement. As stated in the report, the council has committed 80,000 to phase one and 10,000 to phase two, which was matched by the um, Worrell Irrigators Group of for $10,000. Okay, I stand corrected. Uh, it wasn't 100,000, it was $80,000, but my point is still the same. Um, what guarantee and what foreseeability is there, given that uh, the mayor has indicated that this project is highly in the community interest and uh, that there will not be further ongoing support, whether it be in kind or whatever, 
and uh, and that will be a material uh, position of the council to provide that assistance. How do we know what that's likely to be in the future? I'm not sure what else I can say except ideal uh, chair. I ideal in the world of fact and data, not hypothetical um, analysis. Um, the independent group um, will take a project down whatever path and will reach a point that they will require advocacy support. Um, I, I don't believe, watching what's happened with other parallel projects of different scale, they've relied heavily on funding from other levels of government to be able to proceed. And they rely on direct commitments from operators to um, offtakes and so forth. That's part of the process that still is to be managed by the independent group. Um, I believe this project offers great value for us as a region. As I've said, I do not have any identifiable materiality concerning the content of what's before us today and the activation of this process. I cannot, nor can any person in this room, give a guarantee that they will not pursue purchases um, in that area in the future. There are a number of parties at the table who are part of operations that will make decisions based on publicly available information at any time in the future to, um, to best assess their situation. I'm not in a position to make a blanket commitment to not take an action based on publicly available information. I believe that's an unreasonable um, constraint um, that isn't considered in the legislation. Are there any other questions? I have a couple of questions. Um, Mayor, what benefits or opportunities would your involvement provide with reference to advocating for the Water for Worrell project to both state and federal governments? Thank you, uh, Chair. For me, the advocacy is a key part. It's a long journey and advocacy um, partnership, there needs to be um, for any such independent project that serves such a wide range of parties. The track record shows there is a reliance on strong advocacy from the local government to support their constituents. There's a wide audience that would be uh, receive value from this project um, in that are um, both operators and communities that would benefit. And on that basis, it's appropriate for the local government to be supporting with advocacy um, to both state and federal governments um, to, to secure their support for this as a strategic resilience uh, opportunity for a very um, important um, growing region of Australia. Uh, further to that question, uh, are you aware of other similar projects where the Mayor has played uh, a key role in advocating to state and federal governments? It all comes down to what scale would you like to? Um, we obviously have the Lockyer project is the most current one which has received um, unanimous um, support in, from their council and strong advocacy from their mayor. I've witnessed that regularly in um, our engagements, both as councillor mayors when we've been talking with the state as well as federally. Um, there's been strong advocacy for that project in terms again of the benefit it delivers for resilience for a wide ranging agricultural set of precincts and communities and for the security of food supplies for um, for the Australian people, not just for South East Queensland. Um, if you go further afield, you see the advocacy of the likes of the Mayor of Sunshine Coast for a second connection point for um, the offshore cable to give resilience to the internet um, that we all rely on and take for granted. And that was a very important piece of resilience to bring for Queensland, particularly to improve the robustness and the systems. That wasn't a council funded project, but it certainly was a project that was advocated by council. 
Um, there are advocacies around universities, advocacies around rail projects, advocacies around um, road projects uh, that just are there point, to point serve. Point of order, Mr. Deputy Chair. S yes, Councillor Swanborough. Um, the 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 mayor's justification at the moment is nothing to do with conflict of interest. It is all about the benefits of advocacy, and I see that as not relevant at all to the question of a conflict of interest uh, in in answering his question. Sorry, Chair, I was Thank answering the question you asked, I believe. Yes. yes. Thank you for your thoughts. I'll let the mayor continue. Sorry. Thank you for the interruption, but. Um, this, the question before us today is not about the benefits of advocacy of mayors for projects across South East Queensland. It is, it is about, and, and we don't know whether the, uh, the mayor of Lockyer or the mayor of Somerset, you know, is a board member, you know, of an agricultural organisation um, yeah, or any other organisation in which they are advocating. Uh, in this particular situation today, it's a unique situation and the Mayor has correctly identified a conflict of interest because he is a member of an organisation, you know, which competes in this marketplace. Um, that is the question before us today. It is not about the benefits of, of advocacy because we, we have, you know, a whole council here. We have a CEO, we have a Deputy Mayor. You know, who can also advocate for all those things. It's not a, there's not only just one person who can do that in an organisation. And so, you know, we need to stick to the, to the question here is about whether a conflict of interest exists, not whether there are benefits to advocacy by a mayor or a mayor. Thank you. Point, point of clarification, Chair, I believe you asked a specific question and I was providing a fulsome response to that question and I note um, the um, information just provided by Councillor Swanborough. However, I wasn't, I was simply trying to respond to what was your open question. Um, I apologise if I misinterpreted it. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't believe you misinterpreted that question at all. In fact, um, I think advocacy is a key point in this whole discussion because it's very relevant to materiality of the conflict of interest. Could I add the closing comment? Um, the, for me, the, the reason the, I, I appreciate the advocacy question because um, the existence of a material, the question of materiality is one piece, but the public interest balance to that is the other. And the the merits of advocacy as a public interest um, support are well documented across a wide range of constituencies across Australia, not just South East Queensland. I just pulled a few out that I knew of in local in South East Queensland. Um, and therefore, that's the balance of the public interest, which is at the nub of my request today. Um, a third question I have to the Mayor, uh, what benefits would be provided with your participation in community engagement? Again, Councillor, similar to the advocacy, um, I have a wide range of um, relationships and conversations across the communities, um, across the region. Um, whilst councillors have a particular aspect of that, I. Um, um, the mileage on my car tells me how widespread that is. It is important not just to be engaging with the community in the Worrell about understanding this, but engaging with the community in the rest of the region to understand how resilience in the Worrell is a benefit to the whole of the region in terms of securing economic prosperity as a region. So um, that community engagement is an important, it, it's it's an important aspect. It's an aspect that I cannot avoid. People ask questions when you are in conversation. And um, it's uh, the reason for my request is to be able to, um, again, do local advocacy, if you like, in support of this for its merits for the long-term sustainability um, of the region um, as part of that ongoing conversation across a wide range of communities. 
Councillor McConnell. Yeah, if I can just ask the uh, GM. <coughs> I understand the conflict of interest in regards to making a decision within council, but how does having a conflict of interest relate to advocating for a project that may not have funding from council? Thank you, Councillor um, McConnell. I, I guess I'll circle back to the question um, originally raised by uh, Councillor Swamba, Swamba and, and, and reiterated by the Mayor that that do meeting protocols and processes provide the assurance and our documentation around our standing orders and, 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 and such provide the assurance that um, any future uh, declarations, there's a due process in place for councillors to assess and provide the, um, the necessary uh, review as to whether the involvement of those that, that have declared on that. Uh, today's meeting paper, uh, and, and it's available on the, in the agenda, uh, the recommendation it clearly notes it's it's for noting there is no um, there there are no particular allocations of any resources other than potentially a piece of paper and some ink um, for a letter of support um, that that council is committing to. So we have to be mindful that what we're addressing is a conflict of interest on the on this agenda, not anything in future. Otherwise, we're, we'll be bogged down in everything um, in the, in the quagmire of everyone having a potential conflict in in any future aspirations. But in respect to um, the, the, the query around the advocacy, I, I guess in ascertaining, uh, my assumption, in, in ascertaining um, um, for the other elected members uh, whether the, the mayor should be included or to be allowed to stay in the discussions around the matter, the advocacy, advocacy part plays a, um, a contributing factor in, in trying to align the already existing strategic documentations that the council has, the corporate plans, and how um, this particular project aligns to those strategies. Um, that's, I, I guess, in, in my interpretation, that's um, that was what the the, the particulars or the, the intent of the query around advocacy was, was about. So <clears throat> he's not advocating for himself, he's advocating for what's already been um, approved through council. That my assumption is that's correct. You've got a number of key strategic documents that council have already um, have in place, uh, and, and I guess um, you know, from a regional prosperity, this this project aligns with with some of those um, outcomes in those in, in in council's corporate plan. Thank you. Uh, just a question, Councillor to to the general manager. Uh, in, in relation to that, the, you referred to the standing orders. Do not the standing orders uh, allow for, you know, a motion to be amended, a motion to be changed, uh, a motion to be debated and discussed and whatever, uh, just because there is a particular recommendation on the table at this point in time, how do you know that that is the only decision that's going to be made in relation to this matter uh, when we get into discussing the matter? at this point in time. And isn't that what the conflict of interest provisions are all about at the end of the day? Um, we have, a, if, if there is a declarable conflict of interest, it's a conflict of interest, um, black and white, as far as I'm concerned. And um, to allow someone with a conflict of interest, which has already been declared, to be in a position to be able to then influence order, all the other councillors. Chair, point of order. Um, yes, ma'am. I don't believe what Councillor Swambra just articulated very loudly is a correct interpretation when it comes to declarable conflicts of interest. It does for prescribed, um, and this is the subtlety that perhaps um, is lost on many people, the difference between the old days and what we are now required to work under. There are prescribed conflicts and they're quite specific and there's no debate, you must leave the room. Declarable, the discussion then is about the materiality versus the public interest. That is the discussion. That's what I've tabled is what's the level of materiality versus the public interest of being able to continue to participate in this dialogue. So um, it is not a black and white um, any declaration means you must go. It is always a um, it is always a matter then for the 
non-conflicted councillors, once such a declaration is made, to determine where on that balance and what constraints on that balance need to be in place. That is my view. I'd be happy if that were reviewed or clarified by the independence of the GM. Uh, that, that's correct, Mr. Mayor. And, and I guess um, you know, further to that, it, it, it's it's clear in the guidelines and as well as our meeting orders around how how council manages this manages these matters. But I guess in going back to the query Councillor Swambra had, um, you know, it's not up to officers um, to debate the matter. The, the the debate of the resolution is once you know it's in the hands of council, the the elected members, and the elected members will be the ones that 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 forge ahead and if there is a change in a, in a potential uh, resolution then it's it's not voted by the the one person it, it's it's voted by the um, by the chamber or the, the elected members so um, I I just couldn't understand that that um, you know as an author of a report that you put something through you're saying well once a declarable interest um, then we change the resolutions was that was something that you were uh, making indications of I, I guess that's you know that that's probably you know it goes contradicts um, you know, due process and, and, and I guess um, ethics, if, if that was a, 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 a strategy or a tactic that would, you know, em employees would would look to um, engage in, it's certainly nothing that, uh, you know, what, what's put in, in front of you is, is what's recommended out of the report. Um, the report contained, the report body um, contains the necessary information that, that comes to a, a point for, for councillors to consider what the resolution is at hand. Um, you know, there's no um, there's no intent to spring anything out of the ordinary into into matters that's not that has not previously been um, elevated or uh, um, discussed. Just another question, Mr. Deputy Chair. Um, in re in relation to your response, uh, General Manager. What will be would be the situation, and this goes to the question of materiality. At this point in time, we're saying there's no materiality in any conflict here. But uh, having advocated for a project for a long period of time and uh, and participated in the debate both in confidential briefings and also in council meetings over a long period of time, it gets to the stage where council is of an appetite to provide material funding to this organisation. Where do we stand, you know, having allowed a person with a conflict of interest to declarable uh, to participate in that process for a long period of time, and then it's brought to the council for a material uh, contribution. And yet uh, it, seem, it seems to me, and, and I'd ask your opinion on this, that it would be a farce if we say we decided to give another half a million dollars to the organisation at that point in time, and but someone said, well, I'll just step out of the room for that particular decision. But having influenced the decision for such a long period of time, how do you resolve that conflict? The uh, the standing orders clearly articulate the process that, that, that the elected members need to progress. I, I guess I'll refer back to the matter. And you've got some points there, but the further matter at hand is is we're dealing with the conflict of this particular matter. Any future um, involvement or requirement of resources from council will come back to council as a whole for council to to decide upon. Um, and at, at that particular time, um, you know, anyone conflicted will will need to make the, the de declaration. Um, just because I, I, I guess you you put the notion around this particular matter, it it I don't see that council have in any way committed to anything long term, anything that needs to come back will need to come back to, to council for that to be resolved. It's not it's not a lay down uh Mazaire that that it's an automatic um inclusion anyway. I, that I, that doesn't that's not indicated in any of the reports to me. Anything that that requires future involvement even from a a financial in kind or or, or planning or, or or any of those statutory matters um that would need to come back to council. Thank you, GM, and uh, I think either any one of us in this room may, in the future, may have some conflict of interest. You know, I might buy a Lucen farm on the Worrell, highly unlikely, but um, <laughs> uh, 
Um, but then that's the time to uh, that would be the time to declare a conflict of interest. So I have a, a suggested resolution that we move forward from here. Sorry, Chair, oh. for the I, I'm Sorry, if man. there's no further information, I will happily step out for the vote to allow um, that to occur. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, noting that the Mayor is departing the Chamber. So the uh, suggested resolution, uh, which I will put to uh, Governance, John McAllis, to give some background to this. Uh, but I will read out the suggested resolution as a way forward. Uh, that council determines that the mayor can act in the public interest on this matter and may participate in the meeting and decisions. That in accordance with section 9.11 of the Standing Orders Administration and Conduct Procedure, CM02.01, PR.02, that the Mayor is further authorised to participate in other processes relating to Water for Worrell that occur outside of a Council meeting, such as briefing sessions, forums and workshops. So I'll just hand over to... Just a point of clarification. Yes, certainly. Uh, you, what you've just read out is you're indicating that the Mayor uh, can not only participate uh, in discussions, but he can also vote. Uh, is that what you're intending? Participate in meetings and decisions, correct? And I'll hand to John Picalis to give background. Okay, so just, just under um, 9.11 of the um, standing orders that was just mentioned, um, it does allow for once councillors resolve that a um, councillor with a declarable conflict of interest can participate um, based on uh, it's best for the public interest for that to occur. That's the, the reason behind why they've made that decision. Uh, the standing orders also allow um, for that councillor to be involved in further processes outside of the ordinary meeting, um, such as other workshops, forums, things like that. Um, so the, the standing orders actually provide that. So once that's declared, the, the motion is just making that clear that, uh, and referencing the standing orders, that that's permissible um, should the decision be for the councillor to remain in the meeting and, and participate in decision making based on public interest. That carries on or carries over to uh, phone conversations, meetings, other meetings, forums and things like that. Hence why that wording's in there, just to, to just reiterating what the standing orders actually say once the decision's made that the councillor can participate. Now, uh, any questions regarding this proposed resolution? I was I was aware the mayor said he was going to be involved in the questioning, but not decisions. Mm. I thought but that's yes. what the mayor said. He now changed what the mayor said to say he can now be involved in the questions and the decision making. So I think this comes back to that level of materiality and the balance between materiality and public interest. So this is, um, we're going to put that up on the screen just to provide an understanding uh, for the clarity of that. But I mean, if the mayor has said that he has prescribed, he's asked to stay in the meeting but won't make decisions and then we now change it to say he can. He's already said he's, he, do, he doesn't want to be involved in the decision making and I can understand being involved in forums and all that sort of stuff uh, and advocating on the decisions made by council. But I don't understand why we've changed what the mayor said at the start where he wasn't going to be involved in decision making to now saying in our resolution that he can be involved in decision making.
So it's Definitely. now up on the screen if you wanted to have a look through that. And I'm just wondering, can we put up, do we have the words that the Mayor mentioned? Do we have them in writing as well to have? Just there we go. Oh, thank you. So he said he's going to make and then So doesn't that's in relation to leaving the room. There's, a, there's a, clearly a conflict in that resolution that uh, on one occasion it says that, that uh, I would propose to remain in the meeting for the consideration and resolution of item 10.2, but then at the bottom it says I will remain in the meeting for consideration. No, no, that's the vote to, to stay in to the stay meeting. In the that's meeting. referring to oh, the process now. that we're dealing with now. So Council, this is really about what do we see as the way forward for this very worthwhile project and whether we consider that the Mayor's involvement um, is critical to the success or otherwise of this project. Well, consider, can I just make a comment considering that's now an independent um, project outside of Council? Um, Yeah, I still think the mayor has a conflict, um, considering the business and the scale of the business. I don't think he should be involved. If he just said, yeah, I, I, yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, look, I think the mayor has, he's declared his conflict. Um, he obviously doesn't have material interest in it. He's declared it and he said he's not going to vote on the matter, but certainly in his role as mayor, he needs to be on the advocacy side. And once again, I just look through the agenda and everything is for noting at this stage. Um, there's no budgetary, new budgetary recommendations. And I think if that comes along, that needs to be dealt with a bit later on. Yes, that's correct, Councillor West. I'll just make another comment and it goes back to what I said earlier about the advocacy. Once you have a conflict and we're not going to make a decision is irrelevant because it could lead up to we're noting, we're noting, we're building, we're building and we've set a path but now I'm going to step out and let's let you guys make the decision when we've already set ourselves up to go with it. So is this any different to um, when we're looking at regional prosperity strategy and any particular involvement of you know, any of us in any particular relationship? When I talk about the materiality, it's, it's about what is the overall benefit for the community, the community interest. This is the relevance here and the significance or the, the very small materiality that is considered a benefit and whether the benefit of the mayor at an advocacy role and a community engagement role overrides um, any potential benefit uh, of uh, a directorship of a business that's not even in the footprint of the scenic rim. So we've got to look at it in this a bit of a holistic view that where are we going as far as um, key uh, outcomes that we're looking for as far as a regional prosperity strategy, uh, given that there is some really good evidence where the involvement of the mayor in the um, advocacy project and driving this at both state and federal government um, has provided results in, in other regions and when it was discussed uh, at a workshop recently I think those were the, the points that were made. Just a question Mr Deputy Mayor, how would it look uh, in advocacy for this particular project where 
the mayor goes along to a federal or a state body, including the Council of Mayors, and said, I advocate for this project, it's fantastic, blah, blah, blah. And then someone else in the room says, but Mayor, don't you have a de declarable conflict of interest in this particular matter? How is that ever going to be resolved? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think that's really relevant because that's the idea of having declarable conflicts of interest as opposed to prescribed conflicts of interest. And the idea of a de declarable conflict of interest is to put on the table that level. It's not prescribed, it's 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 an immaterial in, in nature, um, but it's it's through transparency, it's, it's outlined. Um, and then it's up for council then to decide whether the, the greater good community benefit outweighs that of that declarable conflict of interest and the, the relatively low um, materiality. Councillor Chul? Yeah, Deputy Mayor, um, can I ask a question? Are the two permanently linked, um, the voting and the advocacy, does Mayor need to have a vote to then be able to advocate for the projects down the track or can he separate the two into a lot? Like, say, say he didn't vote on the project, but he advocated for it, then it provides a level of re removal from decisions made in this chamber. That's right. Um, thanks, Councillor um, Chalk. I, I guess as the um, previously John John Carl clarified, the wording pertained in that resolution um, is, is clearly linked to to what's in the uh, standing orders and just allows those other forums in terms of outside of the ordinary. So what we're talking about is outside the ordinary meeting, which is what today is. Mm. Any any advocacy that that the mayor, you know, it, if he's talking at a um, at a meeting at the cultural centre, that's outside that forum. That that allows him to 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 advocate on behalf of council in that matter. And I guess advocating um, and back to Councillor Swamba's uh, statement before is not advocating any more outside of what's already contained in the strategic documents adopted by council. If he oversteps the mark and, and starts advocating on behalf of um, the, the company he represents, then obviously that's a that's a that's a that's a material breach. Mm -hmm. But in terms of advocacy, like so, any other elected member, you, you're only advocating on behalf of what what's what well, council has adopted and already yeah. has in place. So that's what I said before. It's a bit if we decide it, he can advocate for it because we decided it. Yep, but I just, uh, I, the, the conflict I have is if he's voting and, and in here, that's the conflict I have. Although, you know, we're saying he's outside and all that. I, I watch a lot of politics and the amount of things that you see where long term it, it ends up in their benefit. I just think we don't need that. Um, and I think we're pretty well smart to, uh, to you know, we've got a few sharp heads in here that can still decide what's best for the uh, for the council without having the mayor in on this one to further muddy any waters or people that can uh, can claim things that aren't I think uh, we should just keep with what we were doing so just on clarification to councillor chalk um, it could be a two-step process uh, it could be the first step is that we reject this resolution and the second step could be that council authorises as an amendment to the motion that council authorises the mayor to in circ some circumstances to advocate however we decide uh, for us on, on behalf of this uh, project. And I disagree, I don't think we need to. It's, it's a given that if we make a resolution within this chamber the mayor is free to advocate as much as he wants on that decision, and only on that decision. Obviously, he's not going to go outside it, but that, that's a given that any one of us can advocate for whatever decision we've made in this chamber. That, that's what I was saying. Yeah, so we don't need a resolution on that. Oh, I guess not. Well, no. Just um, hand to GM of Regional Prosperity. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I guess the advocacy that the report was um, leaning towards was advocacy in relation to. Uh, state and federal government has been mentioned earlier, in particular for the further funding for the full business case, the future design and uh, 
you know, the next phases of the project, all of those funds will go to the independent organisation that has been established. And um, to Mayor's point earlier, the connections that he has, the relationships in both federal and state government, um, you would have heard in a recent briefing, the independent members of that board um, mentioned that the importance of having the local government having um, driven and shadowed this project and continuing to do so in order to achieve the next level of significant amount of funding to go to that independent organisation in order for them to do the next phase. And then the ultimate applications for funding to build the water project that they're referring to, which would be an independent scheme uh, in its own right, managed by that independent organisation. Thank you, GM. Uh, Council, can I just suggest that the deletion of two words and see that you might be more considerate of this resolution and those words in the second line and decisions? Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Deputy Chair, do we do we need a mover and a seconder to, before we discuss, discuss um, amendments to this? Through Mr. Chair, just to, to provide um, further clarity, so what Council is resolving today is the the, the, the matter on this particular report. Um, so that you know, as per what's contained in managing conflicts of interest, Council is currently deciding uh, the Mayor's involvement on this particular item, and and Council can set up, set about the conditions of his participation in this particular agenda item. So we're not talking about the, the future advocacy. I guess there's a potential there um, once it, it goes through the process that there's a two that, that could be split to allow the participation. But the first and foremost is, is dealing with the mayor's conf or, you know, declared conflict on this report item, not any future advocacy. So there's a potential there to, um, to add further clarity to that um, draft resolution once it goes through the process to, um, to clarify that. Um, and it's up to council to put to provide when you're just, uh, dealing as per what's contained in the managing conflicts of interest to put the conditions should should allow the mayor to participate in the um, in the discussions. Thank you, GM. Oh, thank you for that clarification. I think that's really relevant. Well, it's more of a comment than anything. We, we do have to be a little bit careful with these conflicts, like. Council McGuinness is not in the room right now, and he's probably the most qualified person to um, give us information about this project. And the more and more we send people out of this room, the less and less we're going to information we're going to get. So um, it is a slippery slope, I guess. But um, in a tight knit community like we have, we all are all involved with each other, and um, we just got to be careful not to kick everyone out of the room, so we can't make decisions. Okay, so um, I might ask for a mover to this resolution. Do we move an amendment first or do we move a motion first? Do we have a move? Councillor. So just a quick one. If this happens, you would uh, the deputy mayor would stay as the chair for ten point one, or sorry, for whatever it is. That that's a condition that council can impose that yeah. <clears throat> that the mayor participates but doesn't. But doesn't chair that doesn't chair. Uh, item. That's yeah. Can we just clarify that one, please, GM? Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, the words participate in meeting, is that clear enough? 
because I take that as I read that as if you're participating in the meeting that you have the right to do everything that the meeting suggests, which is voting. Um, I think if we're going to exclude him from the vote, we need to specifically say that so it's very clear. Yeah. Uh, thank yes, you I for agree. that, Councillor Chalk, and I, I will um, highlight the items in our standing orders that does allow for non-conflicted councillors to impose conditions, so that could be a potential amendment. So I might just, we'll get this resolution onto the table. So I ask for a mover for this resolution. Move. Are there any further questions to what's in place in this resolution, motion? If not, I'll ask for a seconder. Seconded. Seconded, Councillor McConnell. Moved by Councillor West. So I'd welcome any discussions uh, for this motion. Yes, um, Deputy Mayor, I'd just like to get some different wording around participating in, in the meeting. Um, I'll take some advice on what that is, but um, I think it needs to be clarified that he's a non-voting participant in that meeting. Thank you, Councillor Chalk. And I just think it's really important that we're talking about what we're talking about today, not potentially anything into the future. Just keeping that in mind. That's correct, Chair. Um, in, in, in the first point there, it refers to the matter at hand. Uh, and then Council is now discussing what conditions um, should they consider the mayor be able to participate? Is what condition under what conditions um, the participation is? Um, as you indicated, it, participation is defined, but it doesn't include decisions. So you know, a condition could be that he's able to participate in the in the discussions, uh, but clearly not not able to vote on the matter, but can provide uh, clarity and or knowledge and and all those other aspects that that could contribute to the. Um, to the discussions. Well, Mr. Deputy Chair, um, we're not at that stage yet. Um, this particular resolution basically says, are we going to give the, the mayor uh, the right to participate in the meeting, which means to vote and to participate in this and other future meetings? <clears throat> and secondly, it, it talks about uh, being able to advocate in the future. And um, I agree with Councillor Chalk. I mean, we we have one councillor who has left the meeting, who perhaps has is even more of a materiality of interest and knowledge about this particular matter. We also should be reminded that on multiple, multiple occasions so far, the mayor has excluded himself from the meeting uh, when we have discussed this in um, in other in other forums as well. And um, I, I believe that uh, if we were to authorise this in this form, then it would be a slippery slope, um, as someone has already said. Sorry. Thank Check. you, Councillor Swanborough. Just uh, to correct some of those facts, I think the Mayor absented himself from the workshop, uh, but in the December item, it was approved that he participate. Sorry, Chair, just to add clarity again and just to reiterate, there's some points there that that, that are correct that of Councillor Swambra has, has indicated. Um, the matter at hand is the first aspect is 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 really in, in regards to agenda item 10.2. And if you refer again back to the standing orders, um, the participation is is in there because that's I, I guess from when the mayor exited. He asked the consideration of the other councillors for for his 
ability to participate in the meeting, but it's up to council now, as as per contained in the standing orders, to determine under what conditions. If 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 that makes it clearer, I can. Thank you, GM. Um, can I assist in the process, Councillor Chalk? Maybe you would like to put a condition that the mayor, um, along the lines of what you're saying, maybe not voting or but participating. Yeah, I think that first line. Um, the council determined that the mayor can. Um, participating in discussions on item 10.2, which makes it really clear what what he's participating in, and he is a non-voting um, and, and not not able to vote. Um, that would clarify exactly what we're allowing him to do today. I move it as an amendment. An amendment. I understand you're proposing that there be no voting. Is that right? Yeah, and then I just add the words at, at, as a non-voting or not able to vote or whatever words I have to say. <laughs> they cannot vote. So through you, Mr Chair, um, just what's currently contained in the standing orders is that if the Mayor is present in the room, there's no provisions for him not to be the chair. So he he will chair the meeting, uh, that discussions, but not vote. But you can't have because under the standing orders, the, the the chair is the mayor. If he's in, if if he's present in the room, he needs to chair the the the, the meeting. But he's obviously uh, the condition states that he's not voting. I just wanted to point that out because when he comes back in the room, technically the the mayor is a chair unless he's not in the room. Uh, Mr. The General Manager, there is a provision in the standing orders, uh, the last item, I think, for memory, which says if something is not provided for in the standing orders, Council can resolve uh, how it should be. Uh, I, yeah, so, so there is provision for the Council to decide here in, in an amendment uh, that the Chair of the Mayor should not be chairing a meeting uh, under these circumstances as well. Thanks, Councillor. That's only if it's not already provided for, but it's already provided there about the chairmanship of the meeting. But it so, it's not provided for in respect of conflicts of interest. But, um, but, to resolve a conflict of interest, it's not provided for in the standing orders. It's provided for in the context of the chair of the meeting. But that doesn't mean we still can't move a motion uh, within this motion that we can make a stipulation on the, the conduct of the meeting or the conduct of that item. It could merely be a, another condition that we yeah, put. It's just another condition in. that the Deputy Mayor chairs that item. Happy for you seek, to add seek a, the uh, uh, CEO's. Uh, Happy Sorry. to add that. Um, just, just further views to that, about this matter. Just, just further to that, I, I guess I'll refer to uh, the wording contained procedures for the meetings of council. 2.0, the presiding officer. 2.1, the mayor will pres preside at the meeting of council and shall be known as the chairperson of the meeting. 2.2, if the mayor is absent or unavailable to preside, the deputy mayor will preside. So, it, so he's unavailable to decide uh, to to chair it then. Or if he's not in the if he's not in the presence in the in the chambers. Didn't say that. Can you just read that again? Because the, the mayor will preside at the meeting of council and shall be known as the chairperson. If the mayor is 2.2, if the mayor is absent or unavailable to preside, uh, the deputy mayor will preside. Is he not unavailable to preside because of the conflict? It's not provided. It's not provided. <laughs> Uh, Mr. CEO, do we need to have this matter lie on the table until such time as you uh, form a view about this? 
Uh, I think we're we just potentially uh, acting chair the section that you referred to, Councillor Swanborough, is uh, item 27 of standing orders. And I guess at the end of the day, it's for councillors to determine if they feel that a matter within the standing orders is not provided for, then they can make a resolution about how to deal with that matter. So, I mean, these are councillors standing orders for the operations of these meetings. So mm. um, perhaps it's the clarity in the circumstances would mean that perhaps it's it's better if there is the use of section 27. Yeah, thanks. I, I, with that clarity from the CEO, I think we should put a line in there about... Um, Cannot vote or chair. Or chair. On, on item 10.2 makes it easy. Could I just request, oh sorry, could I just ask whether um, the reference to 10.2 is relevant or should we be talking about the Waterfall Worrell project? Waterfall Worrell is 10.2, so if we say, if we say, uh, Chair? Yeah. Chair, if we if we say water for Warrell, we lock ourselves into whenever we say water for Warrell, we're only dealing with item ten point two, so we want to keep it specific to, to ten point two. Okay, thank you. Though it does therefore beg the question: uh, Do we, in future discussions on water for Warrell, are we going to have to go through this every time we uh, do that, or do we not want the uh, mayor, because of a conflict of interest, to be chairing? Uh, Council decisions in relation to Waterfall Worrell and whether it should be the the Deputy Mayor that does that under the circumstances. I think there was an intention of trying to get a, a way forward for the future from today um, because I'm sure that we don't need to be going through this every time. So um, I guess that's the reason for uh, the reference to the Waterfall Rural Project rather than the 10.2. But that can be handled with conditions. So I guess we can keep modifying this uh, to uh, amend it as we consider appropriate. Yeah, Mr Deputy Mayor, if I make a comment, um, I don't believe we can predict the future too much. I think we yeah. need to stick, stick close to what we know and the facts that we know and the items that we know because we don't know where this might go. We've set it, set a sort of precedent here that uh, path moving forward, um, something to reference back to. So I, I'm pretty happy with um, the, the direction we're going here, and um, I put my amendments to um, the chamber. Deputy Mayor, as the uh, the mover of the motion, <coughs> excuse me, I'm quite happy with those additions. And I believe this is about today's item. This is not right. about ongoing. We just need to deal with today. Thank you, Councillor West. So um, I, we have a, a mover to an amendment. Councillor Chalk. Can we just read out the amendment for those Certainly in the um, I'll just... digital gallery? Acting Chair, I just think that the section about the chairing is needs to be referenced separately and incorporate section 27. Thank you, CEO. Uh, okay, thank you, Council. Um, I will read out the new amendment. Sorry, I beg your pardon. The new motion, not amendment. That one, Council determined that the Mayor can act in the public interest on this matter and may participate in discussions on item 10.2, order for the Worrell Irrigation Project update, and cannot vote on item 10.2. That in accordance with section 9.11 of the Standing Orders Administration and Conduct Procedure, CM02.01 PR.02, the Mayor is further authorised to participate in other processes relating to Water for Worrell that occur outside 
of a council meeting, such as briefing sessions, forums and workshops. And two, for the purpose of this ordinary meeting, council determines in relation to clause 27 of the standing orders procedure, CM03.01 PR.01, that the mayor cannot chair the meeting for the consideration of item 10.2. So, Council, we have a mover and seconder for this motion. Uh, That's for the amendment. No, this is the motion. That's the motion. Yeah. So, um, we didn't vote on it. Correct. The mover of the um, original motion, Councillor West, agreed to alter the motion um, with acceptance of the consent. So, Councillors, um, would anyone like to? Have any more questions regarding this motion? Councillor West, would you like your to close on this uh, uh, motion? Uh, you saying close the motion? Uh, close out on this motion. You mean uh, are we having speakers for and against? Yes, that's a, that's, oh, yeah. Sorry, I, I did ask for speakers for. Um, yeah, have we asked for speakers against? Not yet, I'm still waiting for a response. Okay, are you, is Councillor West speaking well, closing it out or not? Thank you, Councillor Swanbright. Would you just hold your breath for a moment Thank to you. allow Councillor West to respond? Thank you, Councillor Swanbright. Look, I do intend to close it out, but I think we've had lengthy discussion here and um, we agreed on the three parts to the motion, so I'm happy to support this motion. Thank you, Councillor West. Now, speakers against the motion? Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, I understand how we've got to, to this, which is an improvement on what it was before. Um, however, I still, in view of the fact that Councillor uh, McGuinness has left the meeting for this, uh, I have a problem with the wording in the recommendation when it says the Mayor can act in the public interest because you know, a, declaration of, a declaration of a declarable interest means that there's some blurring of what's in the public interest and what's in the personal interest or private interest, whether it be in the future um, or whether it be what council does in the future. And so uh, I just think this is fraught with uh, difficulties. It's fraught with the public perception um, that is going to be a problem in this particular matter. And, you know, I think that the, as we've all been trained um, when you have a, a declarable conflict of interest, you're always safer uh, for materiality, um, for perception, for whatever, to leave the meeting and, and not participate. And that's always been my view and, and I haven't been persuaded otherwise today. Are there any speakers for the motion? Councillor McConnell. Yeah, I just think uh, this is a good compromise on what uh, was initially there. Um, again, we can't, I've sort of come around, we can't predict what's going to happen with uh, the mayor and, and the business. He may leave the business in a month or two months, so everything changes. So we can't um, put in there that, you know, in, in two or three years' time, um, if they're going to invest in this, in this area or any other area, so I think this is a, a good um, compromise on what we said where uh, he can participate but cannot vote and and again uh, put yourself as the chair to uh, to run that meeting. I think that's um, that's good. I'd, I'd love to have uh, Councillor McGuinness in the in the room as well to hear his thoughts on some of this stuff. And as we've said, none of the uh, none of the, uh, the the motion that we've got, none of it is to say we're going to do something that's all to note the update. So I, uh, I think it's a good compromise around uh, what we need to remain open and, uh, and anyone out there that uh, says we're not transparent with the discussion we've just had over the last hour and 10 minutes for getting this through uh, needs to have a good listen to this. Thank you. Are there any speakers, any further speakers against the motion? Anyone like to seek leave to speak? 
Councillor West, would you like to have your right of reply? Oh, just my right of reply. Look, as has been mentioned, we've had lengthy, very lengthy discussion about this matter, which has been very beneficial. Certainly, the mayor's declared his um, interest up front, declared that there's no materiality, but certainly his job is one of advocacy at all levels of government. So uh, that has been respected in this, and he won't certainly will not be voting or chairing the meeting. So thank you. I will now put the motion. Those in favour? Those against? Motion is carried. Better call. Division, Division called. On this one, please, uh, Chair. Uh, for, for the motion, uh, councillors two, three, four, and five. Those against, councillors one. Thank you. Um, I will now return the, the chair back to the mayor when he re-enters. Uh, the room and the meeting back to the mayor when he re-enters the room. Thank you. Before you hand back, Councillor, I need to know. I, I actually, I, I actually need to know the outcome. Now that the Mayor and Councillor McGuinness have returned to Thank the you. chamber. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um, in light of the earlier conversation, um, and in light of that constraint, I believe I now need to then advise the meeting of a potential um, declarable conflict of interest um, for Councillor Chalk, that is, not dissimilar to the circumstance that I sit under and that may need to be managed in a similar way. That's all. Um, and my reason for that is that I understand Councillor Chalk has interest in a um, commercial piggery that operates outside the region, that is, um, as well as the pursuits he has known in the region. Um, and that operates in competition to um, a similar business that operates in the in the Worrell and could therefore be in the same circumstance of potentially having an interest in taking advantage of the project as it progresses or should it progress. That's just a declaration for transparency um, and um, in the in the context of the matter. So I still leave that with you, Councillor Enright, to chair. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I will ask Councillor Chalk to respond uh, to the item raised. Yeah, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, I've uh, recently sold that property about six weeks ago, so I'm no longer um, have an interest in piggery. So if that's the only um, um, conflict that I have, I no longer have it. So, thank, Thanks for that clarification. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'll hand the meeting back to you. Thank you. And we'll adjourn for um, morning tea for 10 minutes. And Gallery will be back shortly. Thank you, uh, councillors, executive. Welcome back to the gallery um, digitally. I just, Councillor Enright, just as a matter of process, we need to hand back to you to close out 
the matter concerning Councillor Chalk and I'd be happy to um, move if you so wish. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I would uh, uh, be happy for you to move to close out that um, um, earlier I, item. I, I'm happy to propose the motion that um, um, in light of the information provided, accept Councillor Chalk's um, explanation and that uh, there's no conflict in relation to this matter um, accordingly. And do I have a seconder for that motion? Councillor West, any need to speak or have discussion? Uh, Mr. Deputy Chair, do I, um, do I vote or do no. I leave or do I just sit here? No, you can just you don't you can vote leave if you wish to, but you can no. Yeah, that's right. Um, um, no, you're right. So I'll now put the motion. Those in favour? Those against? Carried unanimously. Noting that Councillor Chalk didn't vote. I'll hand the meeting back to the Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. We now progress. There's no announcements before us today. There's, I've been not notified of any um, petitions and there are no deputations arranged. We come to item eight. Uh, Councillors have had access to the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, and screen active at the moment. Councillor, we, we have um, a draft uh, resolution that the minutes of the ordinary meeting held on the 21st of September 2021 be adopted. I seek a mover. Councillor West, anyone, any questions to that, to those minutes, to that motion? Seek a seconder. Councillor McGuinness, um, wish to speak, Councillor? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Anyone wishing to speak against? Seeking leave to speak additionally? If not, put the motion. Those in favour? It's carried unanimously. We move to item nine. There is no business in the meeting today arising from the prior minutes. Comes to section 10, the business before us today, and we turn to item 10.8. One, um, GM um, Customer and Regional Prosperity, we're in your hands, um, page four of your agendas, councillors. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor, councillors and everyone listening. The item 10.1 is MCU 20 slash 113. It's a development permit for a material change of use involving, uh, involving animal keeping, a doggy daycare situated at 28 Curtis Road, Canungra, described as lot 34 on SP1. 05783. I have two officers with me today, Mark Lohman, Manager of Planning and Development, and Wayne Jarrod, specialist, Principal Specialist of Development Assessment and Engineering. I'm going to hand over um, to Mark to introduce the item and uh, go through the content. Thank you. Thank you, GM. This application relates to a um, animal keeping request for a property located at Curtis Road. It's located west of Canungra along the uh, Lemington National Park Road on a rural property. Animal keeping as a definition is broad in that it includes things such as kennels and catteries and um, animal rescue centres and the like. This application is probably a bit different to anything we've had before and as far as I know it's probably a first for our region in that it's for daytime care and kenneling of, um, of dogs. So Effectively, what they'll be doing is um, looking after dogs through the day and there'll be no kenneling of dogs overnight. Um, in regard to kennels, one of the main issues we have with them is noise created at night for people either you know, 
from when they get home from work or when they're trying to sleep. So this application and this um, this use won't have any of that componentry. So I'll hand over to Wayne to go through the detail and then um, take any questions that Council may have. Thank you, Mark. So just to reiterate, the application triggered impact assessment as the scale uh, of the proposed animal keeping use exceeds the uh, code assessable threshold. Uh, the proposal is to construct a, a fenced enclosure at the southwest corner of the site and included within this area will be a site office of approximately 50 square metres and a shed of approximately 36 square metres. As well, uh, the proposal includes a new vehicle access off Curtis Road. Uh, the proposed enclosure is to be fenced with acoustic materials which satisf satisfy the minimum surface density requirement identified in the applicant's acoustic report. Uh, the use will include two on-site employees and a capacity of up to 20 dogs. Operating hours are proposed to be between 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., seven days a week. The use proposes, as Mark mentioned, no client uh, drop-offs for the dogs. Instead, a pickup service is proposed where dogs will be picked up by the business in the morning and returned in the evening every day, and no overnight counting of dogs is proposed. Uh, the proposed development demonstrated compliance with the relevant codes of the planning scheme uh, through submitted material with the application. Um, we recommend approval. Happy to take questions. Councillors, um, points for clarification. Councillor West. Uh, sorry, Wayne, I just wondered if you could just elaborate a little more on the acoustic report, please, just mainly for people who may not have it in front of them who are listening at home and in relation to those residences that are nearby. I can't find the page, but I think there's four. And the positioning of the fence, please. Yes, certainly. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, originally, the acoustic report identified that the proposed uh, use would be for 30 dogs. Uh, it's scaled down to 20, uh, mainly due to uh, the inability to be compliant with the acoustic requirements outlined under the Environmental Protection Act. So the, the size of the or scale of activity has been reduced and the acoustic fence has been uh, required around the entire enclosure. Uh, might be mentioned in the report that there's still a chain wire fence, but that's uh, that's not the case. So uh, to comply with the acoustic requirements uh, for neighbouring properties, there's uh, that, that acoustic fence is required around the entire perimeter. Thank you. Further questions, councillors? Councillor Enright. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Wayne, in the body of the report of this item outlines that the applicants uh, propose to pick up and deliver the dogs, as you just mentioned, uh, which addresses the concerns of the submitters regarding increased traffic flow. However, um, I haven't been able to see that this was included as a condition for the proposed approval or a reference to the traffic impact assessment being applied. Yes, I'd, I'd agree. It's not uh, perhaps explicitly stated as, as it possibly could. Uh, condition number one refers to different um, reports and the like that the operation has to comply with. One of those is the traffic reports, which um, indicates um, the, the way they're going to collect and deliver the dogs, um, but as you say, it's not explicit as a separate condition, um, although it is enforceable. Sorry, Councillor Swambra. Could I ask a question? Um, just for clarification on what, what you said there, it's not explicit. Um, do you think that it needs to be explicit or not? When you're writing conditions, um, you try to pull out uh, things that are of significance or significant um, concern to the council. Um, in this case, um, 
where it's been raised as a particular issue, um, it probably doesn't hurt to do it as a specific condition. Um, you know, if that was proposed, I would have no um, concern with that. Further questions, councillors? Councillor McConnell. <clears throat> Just a quick one on page 18 talks about submissions, but doesn't give us a breakdown on how many submissions, how many were properly made inside the area, outside the area. Is there a page that has the submissions on that? Page 18 of the report, the agenda, sorry. Uh, it's right after. Page 20, it's a summary. Okay. So page 20, about halfway down, uh, lists the um, the issues that were raised in that um, via those submissions. Yeah, but it doesn't give us a breakdown like it usually does of 200 submitters, 10 properly made. Do, do we know how many submitters there were for this application? I believe there were six submitters. There's seven in the report. I'll go with seven. <laughs> okay. We know if they're all against four. I'd have to take the question on notice, but I know I'm confident that most um, had concerns. Okay. Are there further questions, councillors? Just ask that you remember process, please. Councillors? So, sorry, Councillor, is this a conversation for the Chamber? Well, then can we please not have a side conversation? I just, okay. Just, <laughs> I'm I just only a, to personally stay. asking if you could show me where it said seven because I hadn't read it. So that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll then make that, sure I uh, I bring that up in council from now on. That uh, I, well, councillor, yeah. I'm just trying to help. The officers are trying to coordinate, trying to understand if there are more questions. It's on page ten of our report. Thank you. Thank you, councillor Swanborough. So are there further questions for the officers? Any additional information councillors believe is pertinent? Not. Um, we proceed to the introduction of the item, please. The, the recommendation, please, GM. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, as the report has a number of components listed under the conditions and further approvals, et cetera, and advisory notes, I'll read the headlines if that's if that's if you're agreeable. So the recommendation today is one that council resolve to approve the development in respect to the following property: the real property description of lot 34 SP 105783. The address of the property is 28 Curtis Road, Canungra. The site area is um, 26.8614 hectares and the proposal is development permit for a material change of use, animal keeping, dog daycare. The two currency per period of approval for this development approval is six years starting on the day that this development approval takes effect. Refer to section 85, lapsing of approval at the end of currency period of the Planning Act 2016. Three. The conditions of approval, A, the development permit is given for material change of use subject to the following conditions, and the conditions are laid there from 1 through to 19. That, sorry, just scrolling. 
Um, four, referral agency conditions is there's not applicable. Five, the advisory notes that are included um, A to G are about advertising signs, vegetation management, development con approval conditions attached to the land when the development approval takes effect, the approval lapses at the completion of the relevant, relevant period and the biosecurity Queensland um, needs to be notified and compliance with the conditions A through to G. Six, further approvals are required for A to D listed there, building works, um, plumbing and drainage approvals, application for operational works and prior to discussion, uh, construction of the new driveway, um, property access applications to be submitted. Seven, that the submitters be advised of the following. Submitter advice approval, council has considered all matters relevant to this application, including your submission, and has resolved to approve the application subject to listed conditions. Council is of the view that the development is competent and takes a satisfactory approach in its layout and design commensurate with the stated conditions of approval. And eight, administrative action, that decision notices will be issued in accordance with section 63 of the Planning Act 2016 to the applicant and submitters and referral agencies. Council, is there is a recommendation before us? Uh, seek a mover. Councillor West, thank you. Um, any additional questions, um, Councillor Enright? Mayor, could I uh, make an amendment, please, uh, for an additional condition? And that would be item 20, uh, referring to the delivery and pickup of dogs. Uh, and that condition would be that no delivery or, or pickup of dogs associated with the approved use shall occur within the curtilage of the site or on Curtis Road other than by the operators of the use and the timing would be at all times. Are there any comments to that from the officers from a technical point of view? Um, the proposed amendment or additional condition is consistent with the application and, um, and what we're anticipating will happen on the site. Thank you. Um, so there's a, a proposed amendment by um, Councillor Enright. I seek a, a seconder. Um, Sorry, you, you wish to ask further questions yeah, before? I'm just going to make a comment uh, or a question to Councillor Enright. I just wonder whether that's a good idea at all times, whether it's good them coming and going at 11 o'clock at night, whatever, whether that's in the interest of the neighbours. I understand the hours Sorry. of operation deal with that. Yeah. I think the hours of operation we, to we just those perhaps we ask the manager planning to probably if I can just clarify the um, the at all times refers to when the condition applies so that condition applies at all times rather than the times of the day sorry okay <laughs> yeah further clarifications councillors thank you for the question councillor um councillor Stromer you indicated you're happy to second thank you um you wish to speak to your amendment Councillor. Mayor, it just provides a bit more certainty. Uh, I understand that was in the traffic report, but I think it just uh, having an additional condition just adds that surety, particularly for uh, the residents nearby. Thank you. Anyone wishing to speak against? Anyone seeking a leave to speak additionally? No, we put the amendment. Um, those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Um, Councillor West, you still comfortable we, to be the mover with that amendment? I am, yes. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Any further questions? Any further discussion? Seek a seconder to the motion inclusive of the amendment. Councillor McConnell, I think that's an indication. Um, wish to speak, Councillor West? To your motion. Thank you very much. Uh, look, I just, as already has been mentioned, this is a new concept, a um, new business concept. It is in the rural area and it is um, impact consistent. Uh, we know from city areas that this is quite big business actually. So um, 
uh, it will be interesting to see how it all progresses. Um, I'm very comfortable that the deliveries are going to be, deliveries, drop-offs and pickups are going to be done by the business owner, so there will not be too much traffic um, issues there. And also the fact that there are very stringent operating hours, and I really need to stress that this is certainly not an overnight housing area of, of dogs, so it's not kennels. So we wish the operators well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm wishing to speak against. Seeking leave to speak additionally. We put the motion uh, inclusive of the amendment. Those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Councillor Enright, I hand to you for item 10.2. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I will hand to uh, the GM of Customer and Regional Prosperity to introduce this item. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Deputy Mayor and Chair. Um, item 10.2 is the Waterfall Worrell Irrigation Project Update. I have um, two officers joining me, Economic Development Officer, Business and Industry, Cameron, Tom Cameron Thomas, and the Manager of Regional Prosperity and Communications, Brenda Walker. This, this is a regionally significant project that is around um, improving water security and reliability to the Worrell and Fassifern Valleys. And um, as Council has been aware, in November last year, officers initiated this project along with a group of um, very passionate water, um, Worrell Valley-based irrigators and have continued to work and support the irrigators during this project um, along with Jacobs Australia who has um, uh, the con was contracted to um, lead this project for us. So I'm going to hand to Brenda just to give an overview um, and Cameron no doubt will provide also some input. Thank you very much, Deborah. Good morning, councillors and those listening online. Um, so as Deborah has said, um, this project presents an opportunity um, through improving um, water security and reliability for the scenic rim to become um, an expanded powerhouse of primary production and high value processing, um, as well as securing its position as a national hub for value added and high care vegetable industries. Um, in November 2020, the Worrell Valley Irrigators, comprised of local farmers, growers and producers, approached Council seeking support to understand to undertake Phase 1, the demand assessment of this project, by funding the engagement of an appropriately skilled industry expert, Jacobs Group. Um, phase 1 includes uh, com completing the initial investment logic mapping, the demand assessment and economic benefit an analysis which will ultimately provide an opportunity to bring more secure water into the Worrell and Fassifern Valleys to strengthen agricultural production, grow the value added sector, create more jobs and increase exports. Um, the economic analysis that has been done says that this level of demand would generate up to $150 million in new agricultural revenue each year um, and provide direct economic benefit of $305 million to the region and uh, create over 1,300 annual jobs in agriculture. The recommendations are as listed. Um, the report you have obviously in front of you. Um, Cameron has been shadowing this project all the way along. If there are any questions, I might direct them to Cameron. Thank you, Brenda. Councillors, Councillors. questions? Sorry, I apologise. <laughs> I'm just trying to catch my, I'm trying to catch up through the report here. Apologise, Councillor. Uh, what he said, Councillor. <laughs> what, um, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, direct to Brenda or Cameron. Chair, may I ask a question? Most certainly. Does does the report itemise um, benefit to indiv any individual operator at this stage? No, just for the group. Microphone, camera. Uh, um, no, it's just for the, um, the catchment area and the Warrell Valley and during that, especially if just 
phase, it was for about 70 producers. Further question? Mark? Yes, certainly, ma'am. What, um, what range of agricultural enterprises is it identified, or what range of enterprises? Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a significant range there. Um, a large majority is horticulture, um, value adding through food processing um, operations, as well as your dairy and um, growing, for example, widespread and even uh, chicken and poultry. Questions? Yeah, my question for you to the GM. Um, I, I, I note this recommendation is for us to note, council to note these recommendations. So can I get an explanation around the purpose, why this was brought forward for us to note? What, what, what are we gaining here? And what, why is it important that we um, assess this item today? Thank you for your question, Councillor Chalk. Um, the next um, steps to this project, I think, are probably fundamentally critical. And uh, for us to close out phase one and phase two of the project, having worked um, with the Worrell, um, Waterfall Worrell Irrigators and Jacobs Australia, to report back to Council um, the findings of the, um, the Waterfall Worrell Irrigation Project Feasibility Study is an important piece of the puzzle um, because the, any subsequent funding requests actually happen through the state government to the federal government, so not the independent group as such applying for the funds, but because there's such significant projects like these and others that you've, we've talked about earlier today, um, th this is a very important step that um, I guess um, puts front and centre the findings of the feasibility study report and enables the Waterfall Worrell Limited, proprietary limited group that is now formed to provide this through to the state government and ultimately for the state government to prepare a funding application um, that will um, seek additional funding to complete the balance of the project and to shore up the findings of the feasibility. Um, that application for funding will be submitted to um, by the Queensland Government Department of Regional Development, Manufacturing and Water to the Australian Government's National Water Grid Infrastructure Development Fund. And so it's a really important process today um, for us to have closed this out, um, to acknowledge the work that has been done by everybody involved and um, uh, for then the Waterfall Warrell Limited Group to continue to work with the industry specialists and the state government in forming that application uh, to, to the federal government. Um, this is to anyone really. Um, this this is water for Worrell. It's it's it's, it's a very it, you know, it's for the Worrell Valley, I, I guess. But in this process, has council learned anything that could be expanded to the whole region? Um, in in um you know enhancing other other areas and other valleys um, water supply. As the report mentions, some um, thanks thanks for your question. The report mentions it's a uh, Worrell and Fassifern valleys, but in the next parts of um, the business case and further uh, uh, research that needs to occur, um, there has been discussions about whether or not the solution could be expanded uh, more fully through the other regions or surrounding areas to the water to the Worrell and the Fassifern Valley. It would be a part of that assessment and be considered. Um, any, in any ultimate future funding to build whatever is decided. Are there any further questions? Um, I have a question and I, I wonder for the benefit of our listeners perhaps if a little bit of detail on that expression of interest process and particularly with the funding model and, and the process that the irrigators have have um, expressed their interest regarding uh, capital costs and ongoing water usage and maintenance and the likes. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Enright. Um, yeah, so the expression of interest round, uh, round one was then uh, early, earlier this year to initiate the project to work out how much water and the type of producers would, would be interested in the program. So there were 73 applications received. Um, and noting that uh, $1,000 per megalitre 
um, there was a likely demand of just over 21 and a half uh, megalitres in, in that program, which makes it quite quite feasible. So the next stage is a um, a, de a round two of a demand assessment, um, and that's where it would become um, more detail in in the costs for your annual charges and your, your fees per megalitre for your usage. Uh, we'll narrow down to that. That 73 could quite possibly expand um, about that process. Um, and particularly just to note that the conversations have been investment grade water and high security of that sort of 98, 99% water security, which is com very different to any other projects and schemes um, and the willingness to pay for that. Um, If I could just add to that, um, Councillor, also in the report on page 43, it talks about the next steps being that um, to develop the compelling case, you know, for the Australian government as a part of that Queensland government funding submission, and that would develop then a comprehensive water infrastructure business case, culminating in the detailed business case and the subsequent pre-construction activities involving environmental impact statements and binding water sales. So that is, as Cameron said, the next phase of that demand assessment. I might just add too, it's a shame to Council McGuinness is not in the room, he could answer this probably properly, but I think at the moment there's about 15,000 megalitres used in, in that valley by the irrigators. So to add an additional 21,000 megalitres, so that's more than doubling the current um, use of water in that region just shows how much potential there is um, just in that one valley um, in the agricultural sector. So. Mm -hmm. That's a very valid point um, and a very important point, Councillor. The other um, thing that that does is, as the officers have said, it opens up the value add processing. And we're aware of some providers in the Valley that have processing plants that are only operating at 50%, maybe 60% on a good day. And um, for them to be able to operate 100% will make a, a huge difference in the output and throughput and also the jobs in the region. Uh, any further questions? Appears not. I will then hand back to the GM to outline the recommendation. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, today, councillors, um, it's quite a comprehensive recommendation. Um, the recommendation is that one, council note, phase one of the Water for Warrel project, including the investment logic map mapping, demand assessment and economic benefit analysis contained in the Water for Warrel irrigation project feasibility study report completed by Jacobs Australia Proprietary Limited, which assessed the opportunities, viability and demand for new reliable water for farms, value-added processing and other businesses in the Worrell and Fassifern Valleys was finalised in May of 2021. To that council note that the final Water for Worrell Irrigation Project Feasibility Report has been provided for to the Water for Worrell Limited and subsequently to the Queensland Government. Three, council acknowledge that as part of phase one, the formal round one demand assessment found that in a scenario of $1,000 per megalitre, there is an assumed likely demand of 21,541 megalitres. And according to the economic analysis, should this project achieve government funding, then the level of demand could generate for the scenic rim region $150 million in new agricultural revenue each year, $305 million in direct economic benefit, net present value of 30-year net margin, and 1,342 1, annual jobs in agriculture, full-time equivalent. For count that council note, that phase two to progress this irrigation project was part funded under the implementation of the Regional Prosperity Strategy Budget 2020-2021 and the balance was funded by the Water for Worrell Producers and Irrigators. Five, that council note, the formation of Water for Worrell Limited, a company limited by guarantee and establishment of the board. Six, council note, a funding application has been submitted by Water for Worrell Limited to the Queensland Government Department of Regional Development, Manufacturing and Water for submission to the Queensland to the Australian Government's National Water Grid Infrastructure Development Fund. Seven, that Council note a letter of support will be provided to Water for Warrel Limited for inclusion in the Queensland Government's funding application to the Australian Government. And eight, that Council note the involvement and collaboration between Council Water for Warrel Steering Group, now the Water for Warrel Limited of local producers and irrigators, and Jacobs 
Group Australia Proprietary Limited in advocating to the Queensland Gold Government and ultimately the Australian Government for the future funding support for the Waterfall Worrell Irrigation Project. Uh, thank you, GM. Uh, councillors, uh, I would welcome a mover to this motion. Moved, Councillor Chalk. Are there any further clarifications or questions regarding this motion? Uh, I would now invite a seconder, Councillor McConnell. Councillor Chalk, would you like to speak to this motion? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's been a very worthwhile undertaking by Council. I think it's it, there's a lot of bang for the buck that we invested in, in this project um, and it's set um, on a path forward for the region um, and has a huge potential for economic growth um, in our number one industry, which is agriculture. Um, so I'm very pleased um, that it was undertaken and I'm glad to um, acknowledge that today um, and yeah, rec recommend this for, for approval. So thank you. Are there any speakers uh, against the motion? Uh, well, are there any other speakers who would like to seek leave to speak for the motion? Councillor McConnell. Yeah, I'd just like to <coughs> reiterate what uh, Councillor Chalk just said, that it's a, uh, it's a win for the scenic rim. Uh, and hopefully it's the first step for ensuring water security, uh, which is uh, fundam fundamentally important for all of the agricultural pr uh, producers out there. And it may be the first of many for um, our valleys, so the Logan and the uh, Kanunga area to get uh, water security for the, uh, the turf farms and every other farm out there that uh, relies on this um, to produce the uh, the produce that goes to our cities. So very, very deserving. Councillor Swanborough. Uh, thanks, Mr. Deputy Chair. Uh, look, I'm in favour of this uh, project where it's at at the moment. I think that uh, certainly the, uh, there's some uh, enthusiasm around uh, the benefits as there normally would be in these circumstances. How my uh, whilst I, I talk in favour of it, my enthusiasm's tempered by the realisation that at this particular point in time, we're, we're only taking baby steps uh, in this process. Uh, the real demand assessment, which will determine the actual viability of the project is yet to happen. Uh, you, you never know what the demand for something is until you understand the price of it. And, um, whilst we have a preliminary $1,000 a megalitre at 100% security as a guesstimate, um, until the engineering is done on how that water is going to be delivered. And we know that we don't have a solution to that at this point in time, but that will determine uh, the price of the water and then we will know what the demand uh, is. I, I wish uh, this group that's been set up uh, every success in achieving uh, what it can, but uh, it will take many more millions of dollars in order to get this project to a, a state. And there is competition for the water, uh, not necessarily from water that may be uh, going into Wyvernhoe Dam, but there are other water sources that there will be competition for. And there will be a competition probably for uh, capital funding to get these things off the ground. So I, as I say, I, I wish them every success. I think it's a fantastic project totally supportive, um, but I don't want to see us have unrealistic unrealistic expectations about, you know, uh, we haven't delivered this yet and there's there's no final result at the moment, so we've got a, a fair way to go. Councillors, I'll now put this motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. I'll hand the meeting back to the Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. We move to item 10.3, page 48 of your reports. Um, GM, we're still in your hands. Councillor McGuinness, come on. Well, we've lost Councillor McGuinness.
Uh, thank you, Mayor and Councillors. Item 10.3 is regarding the 2021 Queensland Tourism Awards. And again, Brenda is going to lead the discussion on this item. Thank you very much, General Manager. Um, this report relates to the fact that Council have received advice that it um, will receive an invitation from the Chair and Board of Queensland Tourism Industry Council for an official representative of Scenic Rim Regional Council to attend the 2021 Queensland Tourism Awards Gala Ceremony, which will be held on the evening of Friday the 12th of November 2021 in Brisbane. Um, on the day prior to the awards ceremony, the industry's premier conference, Destination Q, will also be held in Brisbane, presented by Queensland Tourism Industry Council, Tourism and Events Queensland and the Department of Tourism, Innovation and Sport. This year's forum is expected to attract up to 500 tourism and event industry leaders from across the state and will be focused on the theme of looking forward to the future of tourism. And it will cover a variety of subject matter, including forward trends, Queensland's action plan for tourism recovery, cultural and nature-based tourism, and recognise the opportunity of the Brisbane 2032 Olympic Games. Uh, tourism obviously is one of the two biggest industries in, in the Scenic Rim, um, and Scenic Rim Regional Council is nominated in two categories of the awards. Um, so it is therefore appropriate that we be represented at both the awards and the conference. Councillors, any questions to the matter? Not, then um, we proceed to the recommendation, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Councillors. Today's recommendation is that one, Council endorse Mayor Christensen as the nominated councillor representative to attend the 2021 Queensland Tourism Awards Gala Ceremony being held on Friday, 12 November 2021 in Brisbane. And should the mayor be unavailable, the deputy mayor attend in his place. And two, that council endorse Mayor Christensen as the nominated councillor representative to attend the Destination Q Tourism Conference being held on Thursday, 11 November 2021 in Brisbane. And should the mayor be unavailable, the deputy mayor attend in his place. Councillors, your recommendation in two parts. Seek a mover. Councillor Swambra. Uh, any additional questions, councillors? Additional discussion? Seek a seconder. Councillor McGuinness. You wish to speak, Councillor Swambra? Anyone um, seeking a leave to speak against? Seeking leave to speak additionally. Motion, those in favour? It's carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. We move to item 10.4, page 52 of the report, councillors. Thank you for properly, um, uh, thank you for properly um, sanitising the microphone. That's the noise for those who are listening in. Um, we are still in a COVID constrained world. Um, item 10.4, page 52, um, GM Asset and Environmental Sustainability. Could you please introduce this matter? Thank you, Mayor, councillors, executive staff, and those listening in online. Um, item 10.4 deals with an update of uh, the 2020-2021 Infrastructure Capital Works Program delivery. Um, I'll take the report as being read. But in saying this, I will draw your attention to the attachment. Um, within the attachment, um, I will point, point to you um, more particularly um, one of the title blocks and the, the, the associated information with regard to project duration. That clearly outlines those projects that are um, a one-off annual project. It also outlines those projects that are staged over a number of um, stages, not necessarily sequential. And then there are other projects that are um, repeated annually. So there's actually a, a, an allocation of funds, um, for example, the resale, resale program. And then there are those projects that are multi-staged or multifaceted. Um, a good example of that being the um, Bay Desert Revitalisation Project. Um, 
So I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, sorry. One other point I did want to um, mention is there's also an indication of those projects that were underway or hadn't yet started when they were um, planned to be delivered in this um, financial year as um, a blocked shaded area at the end of the, um, um, uh, the attachment. Thank you, GM. Um, councillors, um, questions, Councillor Enright. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And a question to the GM, and I refer to uh, page three of three of the attachment, and particularly in relation to the uh, but as a town centre transport improvement project, um, there are two entries here, and I've got two questions. But my first question relates to: Could you please provide an overview of the work that has been completed to date? Um, that is included in the actual figures uh, to June 30, and it totals uh, around 593 thousand dollars. Yes. Um Thank you for your question. Um, with regard to the work that's been completed today, um, there's been a number of um, service relocations. So this is one of those staged projects where the first stage is around um, making sure that um, the appropriate um, moving of services has occurred in readiness for the major construction to occur. So what has occurred is we um, some power poles have been relocated. Um, there's been, been some recent relocation of NBN services, Telstra. There's some, been some partial landscaping um, or, of um, own associated work's been completed as well, as well as um, a certain amount of um, negotiations with regard to the, the land um, uh, currently where um, this project is really to do with the extension of Sellowan Street to join through to Helen Street, which um, will offer a, a quite a, um, an improved um, traffic flow within that area. Um, as a result, the land tenure that was associated with um, where the road is being extended had to be um, certainly um, sorted through as well. So that's another cost that's been associated with this particular project. Just pause for a moment. Just. There's a bucket of water downstairs. Uh, listen, I have my phone on Do Not Disturb, so I don't know why that. Please, GM, continue. <laughs> so um, I, I believe it was pretty much complete at the point at which the phone um, decided to ring. So, um, yeah, so generally speaking, um, just as a summary again, um, the costs are so th that are, uh, appear on that particular project are in relation to service relocations and um, land process. Thank you, GM. And um, my question. second question also refers to the Bedezit Town Centre Transport Improvement Project in relation to Selwyn Street, uh, and it's in the programmed uh, list on the attachment. Um, my question is, is this project broken into stages or phases? And if so, what works will be included in this second phase? I think to the value of $1.459 million. Yes, yeah, so the, this is actually the se second part of the process. So the first stage was um, getting ready with um, um, movement of um, associated um, services. The second stage is really uh, the completion of the actual building of the extension, um, and certainly part of that will include a roundabout um, with, uh, at, between Brisbane Street and um, the extension of Selwyn Street. There's also associated drainage, and that, will, that is, certainly forms part of this project. There's certainly off-street car parking as well. So those that have, uh, uh, that have seen um, plans of the actual um, What's planned for the extension of Selwyn Street would certainly see the scope of the works that this particular project will deliver. Um, and in uh, just to add to that, um, tenders close very shortly for delivery, and this work will be delivered as part of, uh, as um, a combination of this and the associated car park within um, Davison Park. 
Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Further questions? Uh, Councillor McConnell? <coughs> yeah, just a quick one to the GM. It, there's 66 projects that have been carried over, I'll say, from uh, 2021, 2020 to 2021 to this year. Are they going to be achievable given our current workload for the 21 22? Or is 21 22 going to have a flow on effect and, and spill over as well? All things being considered, the majority of these projects will be delivered. Um, they do vary in size. There are some of quite a large magnitude, whereas some of those um, 66 are, um, uh, for want of better words, quite minor projects to, to for delivery. However, um, I find that uh, sometimes you're, uh, the price doesn't match the, um, the, the timing or the ability to get something, something achieved as well um, when I say that. So yes, I believe at this stage, that's barring any, any um, additional um, uh, impacts. I know this year we did see um, slight delay in some of our road capital delivery as a result of wet weather in March. Um, we do factor in a certain amount of wet weather. However, re previous updates to Council with regard to the Bow Desert Business Park, certainly um, the impacts of wet weather at that site has certainly far and exceeded what we would consider to be an average um, um, for that size or st style of project. Um, so, so barring that, I believe the majority of the projects is listed other than those that are multi-year or multi-stage. Will, will be delivered. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor McGuinness. And yeah, just following on that, uh, GM, it concerns me that you used the word majority a couple of times there in referring to the project. So I take it it's more than 51% as a majority. Uh, could you clarify that a bit more with the question? So um, uh, to, to clarify that, we have already identified that there are some projects that given their, their length in time, they won't be completed, but they'll be substantially started as part of this year. So when I say the majority of probably a, a, the incorrect words, and thank you for picking that up, I'd say a large percentage of the projects will be completed. Um, Councillor West, you had a question? Thank you, Mayor. GM, I was just wondering about the fleet purchases, and I see that we've had to carry over almost $3 million, um, but I just wondered if you might just elaborate on that, and is the situation improving with fleet availability, which has been the issue? I haven't got the latest figures on fleet availability, um, but I will say that um, year on year, um, and I have, I think, explained this um, a couple of weeks ago again, and I appreciate the question again. Um, the reality of it is that um, to actually order an item of plant or fleet, we need to have a budget. And generally speaking, um, I'll take for instance um, a truck. We'll purchase a truck and then the body of the truck needs to be built. There can be three and six months lead time on some of those items. More recently, those lead times are quite uh, have been extended. So the reality of it is, generally speaking, year on year, there is a carryover uh, request for fleet. However, this year it's slightly enhanced through not only large fleet um, deliveries, but also the deliveries of um, our, our cars and um, utes. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Swambra. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The question to the general manager is in relation to uh, the footpath program um, and to the Holt Road Tambourine Mountain job, which was budgeted for $600,000 and funded by a Commonwealth grant, I understand. At this point in time, it says uh, that uh, it uh, is still underway. Um, I understand that uh, that project was substantially completed um, not long after this, the school holidays at, you know, at the start of the year because the, because the principal was on to me about when the depot was going to be removed, um, which it was done um, soon after the school recommenced in 2021. And uh, the, the, the project cost uh, has come under at $156,532 under. My first question is, what happens with the money that's unspent in relation to these jobs? That's a very good question. And in particular for this particular project, because it's uh, fully funded from an external source. 
So um, generally speaking, um, when we put applications together, we lump the footpath projects in one, one um, application so that there is some opportunity to move funds within those projects that are actually been applied for. At, the start, at that particular time, there are, oh sorry, right now the, 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 the project is substantially complete, but at the time when this was um, reporting for, which was the end of the year, there were some still, still some outstanding um, items that needed to be addressed. I do know um, that the majority of the project was completed at the time that you mentioned um, within your question. Um, there was a small section that had to be um, deferred as a result of um, negotiations with the third party, but um, there were some minor works that were still required to be completed. So that's, and for, for transparency's sake, that was the way in which it was reported. However, um, you are correct, um, the project was substantially completed quite some time ago. And the what happens to the money um, that's not spent? Um, so the money that's not spent um, can then be utilised um, through the through negotiations and discussions with the funding body on other projects that were put forward um, within that funding stream. So um, if it was council funds, it would certainly go back to um, either um, fund some of the um, um, overspends within that program area or more broadly across the, the delivery program. However, in this particular case, it's slightly more complicated where we need to um, certainly keep the funding body um, a, 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 a across um, the fact that we were able to deliver that project under the forecast expenditure. Um, the second question, second question in relation to that was um, this, this, this project was uh, very close to 400 metres squared, uh, 400 linear metres rather, which based on the final estimate here comes out at about $1,000 a linear metre. Uh, are you happy with uh, the efficiency of delivering that particular project at $1,000 a linear metre, roughly? Yes, um, oh, look, oh, it, it, uh, even personally, I'm, I'm surprised at, so, at the rates on some of these projects, but when I start drilling down, um, as mentioned with the, count, uh, the question earlier, uh, we've spent close to $600,000 moving services for a road project. Um, I'm happy to explain, expand further at a later date, but I can recall back 20 odd years ago when I was a, a works engineer that um, probably about 5% of the actual dollar figure that what you see on ground was, in, was actually taken into account in traffic control and other measures that you had to put in place. Whereas today, and, and, and you could make a phone call to telecom and say you're in an, in an area, area and you think the telecom line's going to be in the way and you'd have a couple of guys from telecom turn up with your backhoe and you'd be able to move the conduit. Those days are long gone and the actual cost to deliver the same, what I would say, million dollars on ground takes probably 50% or somewhere of that order of other associated costs to actually get that same delivery. So, so the reality of it is um, the actual physically putting the footpath, uh, the concrete path down certainly isn't the thousand dollars a linear meter. It's everything associated with that that ends up putting that, that rate in place. Uh, thank you. Further question, Councillor? Yeah, the further question is uh, at one particular point in time you had an expectation that uh, telephone poles were going to be removed. Uh, in this particular job um, and that that was a, a reason that it was going to cost so much and certainly Telstra uh, services are all delivered overhead as well on those same power lines and uh, my observation is that there were no power lines or power poles needed to be removed in that particular job. Does that surprise you then that the cost was still $1,000 a linear metre? Um, not, not, not particularly. There's still also your um, traffic control requirements, um, and when I say traffic control, that's not only the the um, vehicles that drive along the, the street; it's also the pedestrians as well, which um, is, an, is, is, a, is a cost that needs to be factored in. There's NBN in that area. I'm not sure. I'd have to certainly go away and take this question on notice to to get the full details of what services were involved. Um, it's always um, 
pleasing to hear that we were able to um, come up with a solution that didn't mean that we had to invest in shifting um, services unnecessarily in this particular case, as mentioned by yourself. Thank you for those clarifications. Any further questions, councillors? I, I, I have three GM. Firstly, just to the um, earlier comment, um, there are a number of projects in here that have raised the concern about either availability of materials, not just for procured fleet, um, which as another question has hatched, but um, for the delivery of services, availability of both materials and um, the cost of those materials creating risk to the pricing as well as the availability of suitable resources from a contract point of view to assist delivery. Um, what uh, can you, is it possible to give a clarification of um, what we're seeing as the magnitude of that risk or the particular area of focus for those risks? Um, I could um, go into detail, but generally speaking, it's anything to do with the building and construction industry. Um, I will certainly say that there are some other market forces with regard to concrete pipes at the moment. Um, that, that has um, seen us put out a fairly large tender to try and secure um, ahead of, uh, well ahead of schedule. Um, we're hearing that some particular sizing of your larger type pipes can be a wait of up to 40 weeks, which is um, quite unheard of with regard to those sort of um, products. Um, we are also understanding that anything um, to, relating to steel had been seeing a, quite a, an increase in price. However, that may change over coming months with due to other market influences. Um, I will also say that um, um, we have had some issues getting um, uh, uh, timing with um, appropriate contractors, particularly around anything to do with um, uh, building items. So the, the reality is seen that uh, given that um, there is some of what of a a boom in um, um, the building industry that we've um, found it difficult to source some contractors in that particular field. And as a result, um, to meet funding timelines, we've actually had to um, um, increase the amount of money made available to those projects. Thank you. Uh, my next question also to um, supplement a prior question. Um, there are a number of projects typically um, when we say multi-year projects, how many years can a multi-year project run? A, a, an externally funded or internally funded, but mostly externally funded. What's a multi-year project run in terms of running across financial years? Yeah, so um, uh, probably a good example of a multi-year fu funded project would be the bridge renew renewal program. Generally, that's over a three-year uh, funding stream. Allows for um, confirmed detailed design in the first year moving of any um, services and alignment of contracts um, and then uh, for the second year and then the third year of actually delivering of the project. So that's probably a good example. Um, we do have other projects um, of a similar nature, but as a business park is certainly, oh, sorry, but as an enterprise precinct is certainly one of those as well. Thank you. And my last um, question. Given the delay with certain fleet items, um, what impact, and you may not know this today, but what impact is that having for us operationally in terms of either plant reliability or maintenance cost for existing plant and with that overrun? That's a very good question and I might be able to answer that another day. Um, right at this point in time, I have not seen any massive trend changes. However, I will say that um, with uh, delayed um, purchase of plant, we've seen a reduction, excuse me, <coughs> in fuel costs, which may have masked some of the, the ongoing running costs mm. or maintenance costs of those vehicles. So the reality of it is that, is that, um, that, that certainly may have um, um, hid or shielded some of those additional costs. Thank you. Any other questions, councillors? Not. Thank you, GM. Would you introduce the recommendation, please? 
Thank you, Mayor. The recommendation is that, is that Council acknowledge the 2020-2021 Infrastructure Capital Works Program Quarter 4 Delivery Statement. Seek a mover. Councillor Enright. Uh, any additional questions, councillors? Any additional discussion? Seek a seconder. Councillor McConnell, wish to speak. Councillor Enright. Thank you, Mayor. I will. Um, I think this report outlines just uh, how many projects that we as a council are delivering uh, and the challenges of delivery given weather and uh, component shortage, so on and so on and so on. Uh, so uh, it's great to receive an update on this uh, and look forward to delivery further as the uh, conditions and times and resources uh, are available. Thank you. Anyone wishing to speak against? Seeking leave to speak additionally? Motion those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Councillors, we move to item 10.5. Thank you, GM. And we turn to the GM Council Sustainability to introduce item 10.5, page 56 of the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and councillors and, and staff and digital gallery. Uh, 10.5. Uh, is an update to council um, around the extension um, that, that, that the Queensland government have provided um, as part of the uh, public health emergency involving COVID-19. Um, this means that the um, general access uh, in regards to uh, council meetings and, and public attendances uh, will continue to, um, uh, to be limited. Um, and the extension has been extended from, um, it, it was due to expire 30th of September uh, this year, but it has now been extended again further through until uh, 30th of April 2022. And that's still in, in light of um, just you know, you know, ever evolving um, matters pertaining to um, COVID-19. Um, the, the report's fairly straightforward, Mr. Mayor. I'll take it as being read and, and um, field any queries if, if they arise. Councillors, any questions to clarify to this report? Not uh, introduce the recommendation, GM. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The recommendation uh, for item 10.5 is that Council note the extension of time for the public health emergency involving COVID-19, extending the expiry date from 30th September 2021 to 30th of April 2022. Seek a mover. Councillor McGuinness, um, any further questions? No discussion? Seek a seconder. Councillor West, you wish to speak? Councillor McGuinness? Anyone wishing to speak against? Anyone seeking leave to speak additionally? With the motion, those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Thank you, GM. We move to item 10.6. Again, would you introduce that page 58 of the agenda? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. 10.6 um, just seeks consideration from Council um, in, in incorporating some amendments to the Register of Fees and Charges for 2021 2022. Um, this is in accordance with uh, Local Government Act 2009. Uh, the reason the seeking of consideration has been some, um, some initial oversight. <clears throat> um, there were some uh, fees and charges uh, that, were, that were initially left out of the um, original schedule and also a couple that had to be updated um, in light of the, uh, the new waste collection contract that was um, put in place. Um, those items um, are included in the uh, uh, report um, seeking consideration um, and happy to field additional queries if they arise, Mr Mayor. Councillors, questions, clarification to the report? GM, you introduce the recommendation. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the recommendation is that pursuant to sections 97.1 and 262.3c of the Local Government Act 2009, Council adopt the amended 2021-2022 register of fees and charges contained in attachment one and that these charges become effective as as of 5 October 2021. Seek a mover. Councillor West. Seek a 
Further questions, councillors? Discussion? Seek a seconder. Councillor Chalk, wish to speak to your motion, councillor? No, thank you, Mayor. Anyone uh, wishing to speak against? Seeking leave to speak additionally? The motion, Are those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Um, thank you, GM. That brings us to the end of section 10. We move to section 11. There are two proposed matters to, for a confidential meeting. Um, the first relates to the um, Black Summer Bushfire Recovery Grants Program and proposed to be closed under section 254J 3I um, and item 11.2, request for payment deferment uh, for Summers Road Extension, closed under section 254J 3G. Councillors, I seek a motion to move into closed session. Councillor Enright, um, any questions to that motion? I seek a seconder. Councillor West, wish to speak at all, Councillor? Anyone wishing to speak? Those in favour? It's carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, gallery, we will be um, now moving into closed. Um, and given the time of day, um, we will consider these matters and um, return and, and also include a break for lunch and um, for, we'll aim to return at one o'clock. Always unsure how long some of these items take. So thank you, um, Gallery, and we'll bid you good morning for now. Thank you. Welcome back um, to the Gallery Council as I seek a motion to return into open session. Councillor McConnell, seconded. Councillor Chalk, any discussion? Those in favour? It's carried unanimously. We're now back in open session. We have two matters to address. Um, GM, would you introduce the recommendation for item 11.1? Thank you, Mayor and Councillors. Um, the recommendation is that one, Council endorse the six projects as listed, Duck Creek Road reconstructions, Escape in the Scenic Rim, Government Wireless Network, The Long Sunset 2022, Tambourine Mountain Fire Trails, Visitor Information Centre Canungra, be submitted by the closing date of 6 October 2021 to the Black Summer Bushfire Recovery Grants Program, which are being funded through the National Recovery Resilience Agency, and two, in accordance with clause 22.6.3 of the Scenic Room Regional Council Standing Orders Procedure CMO 3.01 PR.01. Council maintain confidentiality over the content of the report during the assessment process to be undertaken by the granting body. Once Council has been advised of the outcome that the details of the Black Summer Bushfire Recovery Grants Program be reported at a future ordinary meeting in open session. Thank you. Um, councillors, I seek a mover. Councillor West, um, any questions for clarification? Any discussion? No, I seek a seconder. Councillor Enright, um, you wish to speak, Councillor West? Thank you, Mayor. Anyone wishing to speak against? Seeking leave to speak additionally? Put the motion. Um, those in favour? It's carried unanimously. Thank you. Councillors, we move to item 11.2. Um, GM Council Sustainability, would you introduce, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The recommendation is that one, Council provide the delegation to the Chief Executive Officer to execute the Summers Road Extension Agreement on behalf of Council. Two, Council acknowledge that failure to pay the associated costs in delivering the project in accordance with the agreement will result in the debt being recoverable against the, prop, against the property owner's land as unpaid rates. And three, in accordance with clause 22.6.3 of the Standing Orders Procedure, 
CM03.01PR.01. The report and attachments remain confidential and not be released until the expiration of the Summers Road Extension Agreement. Thank you. Um, I seek a mover. Councillor Chalk. Any additional questions? Additional discussion? Seek a seconder. Councillor McGuinness. Wish to speak, Councillor Chalk? Anyone uh, wishing to speak against? Anyone seeking leave to speak additionally? Put the motion. Those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. That brings us to the close of today's ordinary meeting. Thank you to those in the digital gallery for joining us. And uh, we bid you a good day.